So, welcome everybody. We're back on um, H923. And um, I'll turn over to you to discuss how to read. Sure. And we'll hear from Michelle. Um, for the record, Representative Hashim talking about 923. And so, this is an issue that I've known about for a very long time. And the thing that prompted me to um, ask to have this drafted was a recent significant uptick in car break-ins in Brattleboro and some of the surrounding towns. So basically under current law, a person can enter another person's vehicle without their consent, and so long as they don't break anything or steal anything, that other person can be in that vehicle. So for example, I can walk outside my driveway one morning and see somebody inside my truck if I leave it unlocked and they can either be taking a nap or rummaging through my things, and that's not a crime. Um, and in my opinion, people expect some degree of privacy for the interior of their vehicles. I think that if, if police are required to either get warrants or consent to enter somebody's vehicle, I, I think we also need to create some standards for private citizens if they're going to enter somebody else's vehicle. And I, I just want to be clear that you know this isn't some you know law and order type of thing that I'm trying to go for here. It's it's with the understanding that these car break-ins are most likely parallel to the opioid crisis, and it's not as if every time a person gets arrested or charged with a crime, they're just thrown into a dungeon and you know left alone. You know, we we have a lot of resources. <coughs> I believe we have a lot of resources in our courts that allow people to get back on their feet. But when police find somebody rummaging around in somebody's car, there's nothing that they can do about it. That, and that person is just free to go. Then you're just you're just letting the car break-ins continue further. And so, it, so I, I, I'm just trying to give some more resources for law enforcement to to assist and help these people who are breaking into other people's cars. Um, and I think that you know, when, when we think about harm reduction, it's going to be difficult to <clears throat> persuade the public to support harm reduction policies when they don't feel as if their own property is even protected. Mm -hmm. So that is, oh, and regarding the um, the penalty for the crime. The uh, as it stands, the the smallest or the least punitive measure in this bill is imprisonment for not more than one year or a fine not more than five hundred dollars, and that's for a building other than a residence, so like a business, for example. Since cars, the interior of cars, are not equivalent to a house or a building of any sort, I suggested a penalty of not more than six months and a fine of two hundred and fifty dollars. And that's that's the bill. The first one that you um, said in the bill, the first one, do you mean in current law, or I'm just looking for the language that you just referred to? Um, are you in terms of the penalty? What you said first was the most thousand dollars, or, or the the or least or? punitive measure. Is that in here? Is yes, in section. Uh, I'm sorry, line 16. So, so that's current law. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah, okay, building great. other than a residence. And, um, yeah. And yours, yeah. Okay, great. <coughs> great. <coughs> Hi. For the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel. And um, you should have a copy. I've already done um, the amendment there, which I had to do because it was a short form, but I wanted to just show you a little bit of the context of the existing st uh, statute because I didn't reproduce all of it. I didn't include in the bill because we weren't amending it, uh, subsection A. But um, as Nara mentioned, it's so there's basically it's structured so that there's kind of a, a graduated increase in penalties depending on what property the person is, is accused of trespassing. Uh, on and so you see subsection a um, is a three-month misdemeanor 
um, and you'll see if a person without legal authority or consent of the person in lawful possession enters or remains on any land or in any place uh, as to which notice against trespass is given. And so that's the key on this one that um, MY uh, is that uh, you can look at, and there's some case law that says that when it's uh, where it refers to any place, that that does include a vehicle. Um, but the kicker there is that you have to have given the person notice that they don't have, that they're not able to be there. So the case had to do with um, someone, there was a domestic situation going on, woman tells X to get out of her car a number of times, a fight ensued, uh, he wasn't getting out of the car. She, the court found that the vehicle did fit within subsection A, and, she, and by her saying, you know, several times, please get out of my car, please get out of my car, that she had given him notice. But in the circumstances that you're talking about, you just have cars parked in someone's driveway or out on the green or whatever, and they may be <coughs> unlocked. Um, uh, there's no, you know, there's no way that that can work to get at your issue because there's no notice to the person. Um, and so, uh, I'm sorry. No, it's like closing our cars. Right. So, if it's locked, doesn't that mean, isn't that some form of notice, if, you know, versus unlocked? You could go there if you want, like, in, as you guys all start to discuss and listen to witnesses because, and, you know, things like that, how you want to do that. If we look at, if you look at some of these other ones here, mm -hmm. it talks about locked versus unlocked okay. and whether it's knowing, like, to, because you want to make sure, you know, because basically you're going to set forth a criminal provision. You want to make sure that people understand what is prohibited conduct. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can you can go that route. I just from a starting point started it, here it and tried to fit it in is that subsection A would be basically you have to provide the person with some kind of, of notice. If you look at subsection C, that's a person who enters a building other than a residence um, whose access is normally locked. Um, whether or not it's locked when that person enters it or a residence in violation of a court order. Um, and that's a one-year misdemeanor. Then you go down to D, and it's a person who enters a dwelling, whether or not the person a person is actually present, and the person enters knowing that he or she is not licensed or privileged to do so. So there's different kind of standards. So what I used for here, again, just kind of to get things, trying to think about what would be the most straightforward and to get the discussion going was, is I used the standard up in A, which is, the person enters without legal authority or the consent of the person because I was trying to think about if you're going into a, a vehicle you know and I'm sure people can probably give scenarios like I started to think well where might people get confused well what about like the dog in a car on a 90 degree day you know and somebody opens the car you know like and I'm sure the witnesses can probably give uh, you know scenarios where we might want to think about how that works or doesn't work um, uh, but that, but it's without legal authority or the consent of the person. Um, and then C is, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Michelle, you're yep. saying that that could be an issue with the car? I just raise it, but I think I didn't, didn't y'all pass something that says you can actually break into a car? I thought we did, yeah. yeah. I think you might have. I was just, I'm just yeah. saying there may be, as with all of these things, you know, we kind of come up with something and then people say, well, what about this and what about that? And that's the process. That's what we want to do is make sure you don't have any unintended consequences. I was just saying that with this, you want to think about what's going to fit within and outside uh, this the standard of without legal authority or the consent of the person because you don't want to put I, I think for your purposes you don't want to put so much onus on the on the owner of the car to be saying you know because you're saying there's an expectation that if I that people aren't going to be rummaging through my car unless I give them permission at, you know to, to rummage through my car and so I'm trying to think about how do you you know what's the best standard and trying to use one of the ones we already have I do have one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel like there was some sort of exception where, regarding residences, um, where if somebody is lost in the woods, they stumble upon a cabin, and they need shelter in order to survive, they can take refuge in that cabin for the night or whatever um, in order to get through whatever storm. Would that, and I'm not sure where I remember reading that, but would that also apply 
could that also apply to cars in the event, you know, the same scenario, but instead of a cabin, it's right. a car? You know, I, I don't know. So some of the some of the either the state's attorneys or the de, or the defender general's office that ha, may have more familiarity and practice with the with how the current statute works might be able to let you know that. I went through and I just um, skimmed through all the case notes for uh, for unlawful trespass, and I didn't see anything that like that. But that doesn't mean it's not out there. It just wasn't in the case, in the notes for the for the statute. So. Um, you know, I can, I can look at that, but I think maybe some of the practitioners might be able to talk to you a little bit more about the ways that they see um, the statute currently used and where there might be some exceptions and where you might want to create some exceptions in, in this new subsection C. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and so just D is the, is the residence, and that's a three-year felony. So this was putting this at the, at the one year, mis uh, or did you do one year is six months. Six months is in between the subsection A and then the uh, entering a, a non-residence without, what, what was without permission. Section A, again? section A is the, the kind of just general one. So that's the one where you think about where somebody, you know, like if, uh, let's say you have a, somebody who goes to a business and is constantly rowdy at that business or plunks themselves down in the corner and st stays there all day long drinking their water when they meet the table and they're on their computer and they say well you can only stay at this table for two you know and they say we don't we don't want you to to squat here we don't want you to be hanging out here all day long right and we are providing you with you know if you won't leave when we ask you to leave we're providing you with notice of trespass so if you come back we've already told you we don't want you here uh, but if they provide you with notice of trespass and then you come then that's a violation of this and so this is the low level you know, unlawful trespass. And, you know, it's mostly used in the context of when you're thinking about, um, you know, land or buildings or things like that because we have an open lands policy. So, you know, lands may not be posted or against trespass, um, they, uh, things like that. Um, so somebody may not know and, and knowing that you're trespassing and being given, no given notice in some way um, is an important element of this crime. So that last example, I know I'm thinking of the Homeless Bill of Rights and some of the concerns related to people discriminating against homeless people who buy a cup of coffee and are sitting in McDonald's for a while or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, so this is already law, I realize, but it just, it seems like there could be weird ways that people in um, choose to do it, you know what I mean? Like, what if somebody decided that, that they were not going to let any Asians in their restaurant? That'd be a violation of the public accommodations law. Right, but somebody <coughs> might just, yeah, okay. I'm just wondering how overused that gets or if it's. I, again, probably the witnesses, uh, you know, sorry, could probably yeah. let you know where yeah, they yeah. see it, how often they see it. Um, you know, we could certainly ask for uh, data on yeah. number of charges or convictions under under, under this provision if you're interested. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't show you the bill. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> oh, but bill? there you go. Oh, no, there's, there's, there you go. There's a bill. <laughs> I don't need to say much more because we. Um, so this is just adding uh, this new language, as we already talked about. So using the standard in subsection A, so without legal authority or consent of the person in lawful possession of the vehicle, um, then it's a six-month misdemeanor. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Fitzgerald, the uh, Brattleboro Police Chief. Um, it's my first time ever testifying in front of a, a body, so if I uh, go off into the woods, please feel free to <coughs> slap me back, um, and I'll, I'll get back on, on track. Basically, uh, what I wanted to bring uh, to the committee was what I've been hearing from the citizens and what um, I have been hearing and feeling the frustrations from the officers in the police department. That's great, thank you. 
Well, we have um, had a dramatic increase of uh, vehicle break-ins in the last three months compared to the previous year, a uh, 225% increase. And same uh, time period. And uh, that brought to light some serious challenges when we went to look to find out, okay, what what is going on here and what, what can we do? And I believe that number is much, much higher because a lot of vehicles were gone through that they didn't call the police department simply because, you know, it was just a couple cents or cheap sunglasses, whatever the reasons. I've heard many of them. Um, but after this came to light, it, it was a groundswell of people saying, yes, my vehicle was rummaged through and um, I didn't report it. So I, I believe that 225 is a very, very conservative uh, number in, in the increases. We, um, the, the citizens were extremely frustrated when we would respond and if there was, if the vehicle was locked and there was damage and they went into the vehicle, then we had the tools that we could uh, utilize in that. If the vehicle was unlocked and they stole something, we had the tools in place um, to deal with that. What we didn't have in place were the tools if they went in the vehicle, rummaged through the vehicle, did no damage, and took nothing but then left. And it was even a case where people were hanging out. They were like napping, like you were saying, in the vehicles. And the, the homeowners were extremely frustrated with law enforcement when we pretty much told them that uh, Look at, please call us when they come up here. We can talk to them, we can ID them. Um, but other than that, there's, there's, uh, we, we can't arrest them for this offense because there is no offense. And, and they were, they didn't feel safe. They were fearful, they were frustrated, they felt abandoned by the community, by, by the government, by the law enforcement. And as in many Vermont communities, a lot of the uh, individuals also snow plowed. And their significant others would stay up at night while they went out and snow plowed in the wee hours of the morning before they would go to work. Mm -hmm. We'd get a snowstorm, they'd get up at two or three. They were so afraid of people being on their property and in their vehicles and are they coming in the garage? Are they gonna come in the house? Um, that they literally would stay up. And the other individual, as they snow plowed, would constantly go by the house to make sure everything was okay. And that was, uh, I, I heard that more than once by numerous people, that it was extremely nerve wracking. There were certain things that they could do that we told them were options. Uh, according to 3705, you could post your property as no trespass. That is notice. If it's posted, it's clearly visible, that is considered notice. Some of them did do that. Some of them also put in, at great expense, uh, some really good video cameras, uh, some really good lights. The problem with that is now certain neighborhoods, to be quite honest, look more like a penitentiary than a neighborhood that you would want to move your family to. No trespass signs posted all over garages, front porches. Uh, you walk down the sidewalk, four or five floodlights would go on. Um, and it, it's really detracting, uh, especially if you were gonna put your house on the market or if, if you wanted uh, to move to, to that community, you, you would might think second twice about it. But those were the options. Get some cameras, light the area up, and post your property at, at this point. It was absolutely incredible that a, a citizen brought me a video of an individual that walked up her driveway, looked in the car, the glass was too dark for that individual to look into, went over to the floodlight, waved his arms so the light could come on and then go back and look in the vehicle. I mean, that's how brazen uh, some of these individuals are, are getting. So, needless to say, they were, there were some, uh, there were, there were some frustrations. 
as police officers, it was talked about earlier, um, I will always assume there was an expectation of privacy in someone's vehicle because we needed a warrant to go in there. And maybe wrongfully so, but I just assume that extended to every citizen, that an individual in their vehicle had an expectation of privacy in that vehicle. Um, it, it was just common sense, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that wasn't the case. <coughs> Our officers, where we're at, um, we look at community issues uh, maybe a little bit differently than your traditional law enforcement officers uh, down in Brattleboro. Our mission statement says in part that when we're dealing with the public, we will conduct ourselves accordingly and know the difference between those who need our help those who made a poor decision, and those who choose to victimize others. And every time we go out on a call, that is exactly how the officers are expected to adjust, it, conduct themselves. Ask them this one question. Is this individual a person that needs our help? Is this an individual that made a poor decision? Or is this an individual that chooses to victimize others? The goal that we try to do is when we're talking the quality of life issues, and let's be honest, that's what we do mostly. Uh, there's, there's this misconception out there that um, we do a lot of criminal cases. It's not, not so much the case. Uh, we do more quality of life issues than we do criminal cases throughout our day. If you had to look at the 10 hour shift of an officer, I would, I would be very surprised if less than 70% was not quality of life issues, and 30% was dealing with criminal issues. So, with, with that in mind, yes, sir? How was that? Uh, how long have you been a, a police officer? 20 years, sir. 20? Yes. Yep. <clears throat> the the 70 30 with uh, uh, life issues, how much has that changed since you started? The flip flop? Pretty close there. Well, I would say the what what has changed mostly is is the attitude towards it. When I first started, if it was not a crime, we pretty much didn't address it. Like if it was a mental health issue, mm -hmm. um, if it was something like this, we wouldn't pursue it. We'd be like, "There's no crime here," um, and then we would just move on. Right. Right. Um, so now I think the law enforcement, thank God, has evolved. In, in the past several years to be more of a uh, front line dealing with quality of life issues because we, we're, we're the first contact with a lot of these individuals. And if we have the tools at our trade where we can get them in the system and get the help that they need, ultimately the goal is to fix why are you in that car at two o'clock in the morning. Not giving you a citation because you're in that car at two o'clock in the morning. So, and unfortunately, too many times, people have equated law enforcement involvement with incarceration. Incarceration's a way, but not the way. There's a lot of options within our judicial system that we can get people in there. You have restorative justice, you have diversion, and, and you can reach out to all these different services to, to hook this individual up with, and hopefully they can get whatever help they need, whether that be mental health, uh, substance misuse, uh, homelessness, um, a, you know, the, the list is very long. But that's where I think, and I apologize for the long answer, but I think no, that's, great. that's where the law enforcement that I have seen has changed greatly um, since I've, I've been on. See, I got you off into the woods so <laughs> <laughs> personally have seen that work uh, within our own department. We started off with the within the opiate crisis, um, ravaged Brattleboro. We're right there off of 91. Mm -hmm. And the, the three states, it, it literally ravished and still is. We started what we called a, a, a program called Project Care. And basically what we did is, in line with our mission statement, finding people that need our help, we would go up 
And like if someone OD'd, we go back to that residence within 24 hours and talk to everybody that's in that residence. Even not just the person that just OD'd, but everybody that was associated with them. Let them know about the different uh, services that are available and, and just keep on contact with that. People that we have arrested two, three times a week for substance misuse now work for the police department in project care because they have gone through recovery, they have gone through turning point, they're still in recovery, um, and they are on our team. Yes, Is there sir? any similarities to Project Vision and Rome? I'm not familiar with that. I have heard of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm really not um, familiar with that. There's, more there's, 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 some, there's no similarities. Yeah. So we, the biggest thing is accountability. I mean, and it, this is not a, uh, you know, we're, we're totally turning a blind eye to people's actions. Nothing can be further from the truth. The point is there's different ways people can be held accountable. Um, and it doesn't have to be in a cage. And, and that's, that's what I promote, that there's different ways that you can hold people accountable. Um, so the, the, it does work. Uh, I have seen it work uh, with my own eyes, uh, with people that uh, we have reached out and made them held accountable for their actions, but have turned around and uh, been very, very successful members of our community. As a matter, they work with us uh, when we go to these homes. These individuals don't want to talk to me, but if there's a person there that they know, I don't know the trials and tribulations that these individuals go through, and I'm not even going to pretend that I know. I'm not going to read an article and regurgitate it back to somebody who is experiencing uh, these, these, these demons. Um, but an individual who has walked that road can talk to them. And when they get ready, we're there to introduce them in there. I did go off into the woods again. I apologize from, from going into cars to heroin, but it is, it is parallel. And sometimes they intertwine each other where why is that individual in that vehicle? And I, I truly hope that you would support this bill because I think it would be a disservice to both the homeowners who have that expectation of privacy and to the individuals who need our help and we can get them in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Marshall. Just get my screen up here. Um, so our office is very much opposed to this bill. I think that this bill is going to criminalize way more people that you don't intend to criminalize than it is going to address the problems that you are attending, attempting to address. This has no mens rea or requirement in it. That means there's no requirement that somebody be intending to do any harm when they go into a car in order for them to be criminalized for it. So for example, just the other day, um, I want to say it was last week sometime, uh, one of the people in my office called, who, whose office overlooks the parking lot called over to me, who my office doesn't overlook the parking lot, to tell me that somebody was in my car. Um, and I went over and I looked out the window and sure enough there was somebody who was sitting in my car and they had the door open. And I went down, to, I grabbed my shit, ran down <laughs> my stuff and ran down <laughs> sorry. I'm, I apologize, this has been a long time Sorry. I've been here and I've yeah, never right. done that before. Um, I grabbed my stuff, I ran downstairs, and it was somebody who works in another building right next to ours, who was actually <coughs> meant to get into her car, which wasn't exactly like my car, but very similar, both compact white SUVs, which is one, two cars over with a big van in between them. I, before I drove this car, um, I drove a Honda Element, and then before that, I drove a Forest Green Subaru Outback station wagon, which had to have been the most popular car in Vermont, at least at the time. And on at least three occasions, I got into the wrong car. Twice it was the same wrong car from somebody who had a similar car that parked it uh, where I dropped my kids off for uh, summer camp. 
occupied day camp. And then one time, it was actually right here on the street in Montpelier. And that time, I actually got in, and they, just like me, leave their keys in the ignition. I started the car. And it was only when the radio came on, and it wasn't my station, that I realized that it wasn't my car. Um, and so I took a quick poll of the people in our office. And with the exception of one secretary, Every single person in my office said that they had, at some point or another, gotten in the wrong car on accident. Um, and in fact, it prompted one story, which was actually I had heard, but I'd totally forgotten about until somebody reminded me of it, which is one of our attorneys uh, in our office who'd been there for a long time actually accidentally stole somebody's car. Um, for a, a, it was she was in her first week at the office, and it was her first time uh, doing work outside of the office, and she had to go get a fleet car. Uh, and somebody explained to her, oh yeah, you just go over to the fleet parking lot and there will be a, a, a Toyota Prius uh, that's there for you. And she went and she found a Toyota Prius that was unlocked and it had the push button start. And she started it and drove up to Waterbury. And it was only when she was pulling out of Waterbury and a cop stopped her to tell her that the car she was driving had been reported stolen um, that she discovered that she had gotten in the wrong Toyota Prius and it was somebody who had left their key fob, I guess they don't have a real key in the Priuses, but a key fob in the Prius, and the thing started up and she drove away with it. So it really is something that happens accidentally all the time. And what the police do in that instance? Oh, nothing. They just, you know. And, and I think that that is, you know, obviously, this is, that's not the type of conduct that this is intended to criminalize. But I think that when we criminalize a wide swath of conduct, some of which we intend to criminalize, some of which we don't, um, we just end up in a situation where it becomes complete police or prosecutor discretion as to who gets charged and who doesn't. And yes, in 90% of the cases, police and prosecutors exercise their discretion appropriately. They charge people appropriately, and they don't charge people when there's not a good reason to charge people. But there's a significant number of cases where that doesn't work out, or where people see things differently, where somebody says, no, this was an accident, and another person is saying, no, we don't see this as being an accident. I mean, honestly, um, if I had been picked up after the second time I accidentally got in the other guy's car at the rec camp parking lot, um, somebody very well could have looked and said, nobody makes that mistake twice with the same car, um, and come up with a good theory that, that I was actually intentionally getting in other people's cars, which I wasn't. It was just early in the morning before I had my coffee, and um, one green outback sure. looks like another. Um, so my only point is that really this is actually a very, very broad offense. It criminalizes a lot of behavior that I don't think we mean to criminalize. And it doesn't actually address all of the problems um, that the chief of police was talking about that are, that are happening out there. And honestly, you know, the best solution to this problem would be for people to lock the doors to their car, which, you know, I'm as guilty of anyone else as not, of not locking the doors to my car. But um, that would solve the problem. And nobody can break into a locked car and have that not be a crime. And for that matter, nobody can break into a car and steal something, even something trivial like sunglasses, and have that not be a crime. Um, those really make it clear that you are doing something wrong. If, you, if a door is locked and you keep persisting getting into the car, then you've clearly you, you clearly are a wrongdoer, and you clearly are in the category of people who don't. We don't need a new law to criminalize. It sounds like your that intent is having that, like knowingly or something is. That's yes, though I also would say that it's not necessary. It, it, adding the intent language would render the whole bill unnecessary because if you put in language that says something like that, you have an intent to steal something out of the car, do something wrongful like that. You've already proven all the elements of attempted uh, larceny or attempted theft. Um, so, because if you prove that someone has the intent to steal stuff, and they actually take the step of breaking in a car into a car to do it, that certainly gets you far far enough along the path of an attempt um, that they've already broken the law, and they've already broken a law that's more serious than this one. I mean, yeah, thank you. Well, I was going to ask a similar question to Maxine's, but. I mean, what if it was the intent language was not intent to steal, but just intent to enter a vehicle that you know not to be your own, right? I mean, is there, you sort of alluded to this earlier where you said it doesn't get at the problems you're trying to solve. Um, well, and the reason I mentioned the problems we're trying to solve is because I think the, the chief uh, mentioned a few points that were really more about enforcement and identification rather than criminality of what was involved. 
um, you know, when it comes to the question of a rash of car break-ins and the need for lights and cameras and whatnot, that really has to do with identifying perpetrators, not criminalizing something that's not already criminal. Um, but when it comes to intent, like what you're suggesting would be more like a knowledge provision that says if you enter a car with knowledge that the car doesn't belong to you, et cetera, et cetera. I, I mean, I think that would be fine. I think that would solve the problem. Um, would your office support the, the bill, or would you still see We're not going to support uh, you I mean, know, a I'm new criminal to, penalty yeah. for something that we don't see as really being right. a major issue. Um, but at the same time, uh, would it certainly take it out of the realm of where we see it now, which is as something that is way, like, probably criminalizing a lot more conduct that you don't need to criminalize than that you do? Uh, certainly that would address that problem. I mean, I think probably on any, on any given day in the state of Vermont, more people accidentally open up the wrong car door than purposefully open up the wrong car door. Um, right. That's just speculation, but given, so given a quick perusal of my office, it sounds like it. Because your testimony is focused mostly on the question of intent and these ac accidental entries. So if we, you know, if we added that provision, can you tell me more about why the Defender General would still oppose? Sure, because there's no need for this. I mean, we're at a point right now, we have the lowest property crime rate in the history of Vermont, uh, as long as we've been keeping statistics. It is so, dr I mean, it's it's gone down precipitously to the point where, uh, you know, just 10 years ago, uh, 20, I guess I didn't have 2010s statistics, so 2009, for whatever reason, the chart I was using used odd number years. So it would go 2009, 2011. But so about 10 years ago, not quite 10 years ago, the, violent, or the uh, property crime rate in Vermont was double what it is now. About 10 years before that, it was double what it was then. When you go back to 1980, it was about five, almost six times as high as it is today. So we're already looking at, like, we have an extraordinarily low property crime rate. We have an extraordinarily low rate of crime overall in general, uh, both compared to other states and compared to Vermont historically. And we just don't see there being a real need for a provision that really is going to be used to target the most vulnerable people in Vermont. I mean, if we're talking about people who are breaking into unlocked cars and rummaging through them and not stealing anything, I'm not exactly sure what puts you in a position where you're doing that kind of thing, but it can't be anything good. Um, just not seeing the necessity for yet another criminal offense, yet another criminal penalty. I mean, we have this history in Vermont of the crime rate decreasing, and yet we criminalize more things and more people wind up in jail. You know, and, and I appreciate what the chief says about there being a lot of non-incarcerative options for um, dealing with people, but this is a statute that just provides an incarcerative option. Um, you know, it's. We talk a lot about the non-incarcerative options that are available, and yet we still pass statutes over and over again that only provide for incarceration as a remedy. To our mind, this isn't a problem that needs to be solved, certainly not by putting people in cages. Uh, Selena covered basically what I was going to ask, too, because I mean, one of my concerns was people unintentionally getting into other people's cars. I mean. I almost did it once, and then my daughter, even my daughter was like, I don't think this is your truck. <laughs> um, and so I certainly don't want to criminalize the people who are just having an airhead moment. <coughs> I don't have those. But I mean, I, I so, so if we were to introduce language that treats the intentionality, that introduces the intentionality ele element of it, would that bring you from very opposed to just opposed? Yes. I mean, you know, because we're opposed for a couple reasons. One is we don't support the concept. The other is the way that it's implemented here, we think criminalizes way too much stuff. Um, so yeah, that would move us from very opposed to opposed. double opposed to single opposed, okay. I suppose. Okay. And, and I, I just, I, I just think that, you know, I mean, I mean, you're saying that it's not necessary, and you know, I, I do just respectfully disagree because, you know, I. When I think about my car, I think about the belongings that I have in there and the expectation of privacy that I have for it. You know, I'm, I'm not okay with people rummaging around mm. through my stuff. So I'm just, just wanted to throw that up there. 
Understood. Um, and I, I haven't even spoken to the contract, but if it was a um, civil violation? Sure, that would go a lot further towards making us uh, supportive of it. Again, I, I don't, I'm sorry, but I just, I'm just throwing no, it's it out just there. Idea, yeah. um, well, and that would give, um, you know, that would certainly give people, making it a civil violation would, I'd have to think about what that would do as far as giving the police a hook to get in and go and deal with people. I mean, it would certainly, I'd have to take a look at that, but yeah, I mean, I think that would certainly alleviate a lot of our concerns. Okay, and then Michelle is, I just ask a question about that. Would that then um, foreclose like access to some of the more restorative? Hmm. Probably, but I mean, I'll tell you, like, I, you know, I'm always resistant to criminalizing things as a way of providing services. I think the criminal justice system is a terrible way to provide social services. So I think, yes, you know, a civil violation is not going to make you eligible for kind of court diversion programs, um, but at the same time, you know, we shouldn't be criminalizing things just to be, get people into court diversion. Uh, there's got to be a better way to provide social services than through the, I mean, it's something I always kind of bristle at because, you know, I, I was in social work before I went into law. I don't want to, lawyers are terrible social workers, judges are terrible social workers. We do it because we're a lot of times the end of the line. Um, but. You should have social workers doing social work and channeling people into social work and making connections and making referrals and doing that work. Not, and it's a super expensive and inefficient way to do it too. I mean, yeah. I mean we're, would, we're, we're bad social workers and we're expensive social workers. You would get no disagreement from me on that <laughs> argument. I think, but what I think I've seen in Burlington, where people use a lot of civil violations. Um, and ticketing for similar kinds of offenses that might be related to um, similar root causes is that what happens is people accrue hundreds, I mean just fine after fine after fine and there's no way to, there's, there's not this option to then. It is, I mean we know. It's a financial insolvency issue. We know that both um, incarceration and financial penalties are really lousy ways to change people's behavior. Um, they tend to not work. Uh, incarcerating people tends to make them behave more poorly than they did before they were incarcerated. Uh, giving people who can't afford fines fines doesn't really do or accomplish anything. Doesn't seem to be good or bad as far as recidivism goes. Just seems to be a non-issue. Um, that said, um, you know, that's based mostly on national research and maybe in Vermont where we have, where we do have more social services available than a lot of states. Um, maybe the results are different. I'll tell you that when it comes to this type of sort of, you know, what I would consider a quality of life offense, the kind of stuff like, you know, when I lived in New York, the kind of this is the people who hop turnstiles that they would pick up and the people, you know, the stuff that's like, it is undoubtedly not good that people are doing this stuff, but does the criminal justice system actually have an adequate response to it? I, I would say that I don't think that our system has the tools to solve the problem that you're trying to solve here. Um, you can certainly criminalize this and that will cause some people to come into the system. Will this solve any problem? So if we hypothetically remove the six months of incarceration but leave the $250 fine and make it remain a criminal violation as an avenue that leads to more of the restorative justice programs that um, Celine was discussing, would that be slightly more palatable? Absolutely. I mean, you know, from our perspective, incarceration is the, so, you know, incarceration is so, blunt and inappropriate of a tool for this case that if you remove incarceration from it, that really does remove a lot of our objections to it. Yeah, to complicate matters further, but because um, I see where Representative Hashim is going with that, that there might be more access to diversion, to restorative justice, to eliminating the, having the fine imposed altogether, right? If, 
if it remained a criminal violation, but can you talk about the collateral consequences for folks who don't get the restorative option of a misdemeanor conviction versus a civil violation? Even if they do get the restorative justice uh, alternative, there is still a lot of collateral consequences that go along with it. Um, even a civil criminal conviction uh, has a lot of collateral consequences, and you know, honestly, it's even though there's been a lot of efforts to mitigate the collateral consequences of convictions, um, it's almost like from our office's perspective, and this is purely anecdotal, but um, it's almost like we're seeing more and more. I mean, I just spent a few hours on the phone earlier this morning dealing with a situation where it was, I was talking to a uh, armed services recruiter about a former client of mine um, who was trying to join, I think, the Army. I forgot. Um, but in any case, the point being that uh, they were able to look back and see expunged arrest records, and they were using those as a disqualification uh, from for military service. Um, and I, if you had asked me before I talked to this guy, do the, can a military recruiter get access to an expunged arrest record? I would have guessed no. Um, and I was surprised to find out that they do. And I, we keep seeing more and more and more of that. So, yeah, Is absolutely. Was like a misdemeanor, though, or a felon? It was a misdemeanor. Um, and it, was a, it didn't end in a conviction. It was just an arrest. And we had gotten the a record of the arrest expunged. Um, and yet it still wound up somewhere. I asked him where, and he wouldn't tell me where he got it from. Wow. So I don't actually know. Uh, and in fact, you know, there's still, um, I was just the other day looking at, this was a problem I thought was completely solved, and it turned out it isn't. Uh, on college applications, uh, they still ask you whether you've ever been arrested for anything, even if it's been expunged or anything like that. Um, I was just working with another former client of mine on a college application that still, to this day, asks if you've had arrests as a juvenile, um, and just asks about arrests, not even convictions or anything like that, uh, just mere arrests. Um, which there is, if you ever run into that problem, the way around it is you can, it costs more, but if you use the common application, that one doesn't ask. Um, it's only the institutionally specific ones. Well, I'm just... Yeah, no, it's good. It's, it's, good, it's good, good information. Good point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Good. Uh, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. So um, this bill, uh, when I heard about it and saw the sponsors, I reached out to our Wyndham County State's Attorney, wondering if um, she was the one that had requested this, and she hadn't. But she did absolutely agree with the testimony that we've heard today, that there are a huge number of these break-ins in, in vehicles um, in her county, and she certainly supported the proposal. Um, I only had the short form. I didn't... So I had, didn't see the specific language at that point. Um, but, you know, I think that there actually is an imp implied intent in this already of knowingly. Um, but we would have no issue with adding that explicitly kind of as it's drafted um, behind me. I think already um, defendants can raise the affirmative defense of mistake. So I don't think that anyone who mistakenly entered a car would actually be criminally liable um, for doing that. So I, I don't think that's a, a real concern with this bill. Um, and then with respect to um, necessity, I think is the affirmative defense of necessity is what you were talking about. If it was incredibly cold outside and someone had to enter a car in order to stay warm overnight, um, that's an, another affirmative defense that already exists in Vermont law. Um, you could add it explicitly if you wanted to. However, I don't. It's already in there. Yeah, it's already part of Vermont law. Um, so. Yeah. Can you just say what the where we would find that? It's uh, established through case law. Just the. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not a. It's not. A, I don't think it's. It's, it's not. In, it's just. It's just a common law concept, and there's a showing that has to be made by the defendant, um, essentially that the risk of harm outweighed the criminal act. So, um, I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's essentially the concept. Um, we wouldn't have any objection to um, decreasing the penalty. I think that there is kind of a range of 
uh, motivations for this type of crime and the fact that it is a lesser penalty is actually good for us. We, we think that it should be a diversion presumptive crime, a presumptively diversion eligible crime. So, but then if there is kind of an escalation of the behavior, if it's kind of a, a rash of these things or repeated behavior, then having some sort of graduated sanction, you know, makes sense. Um, so, I mean, whether you eliminate the, um, the incarcerative penalty altogether or have it, I mean, disorderly conduct has a 60 day maximum, um, you know, it's, it's good to keep this at as a low level misdemeanor either way is my point. Um, so other than that, I, I, you know, the state's attorneys are supportive of, of this bill. The, and the justification for keeping it a low-level well misdemeanor being that then it's diversion-eligible. Diversion-eligible, um, presumptively diversion-eligible, and it's in line with, you know, what I would consider similarly harmed crimes, uh, unlawful mischief, disorderly conduct. And then I think the justification when I talked to the lead sponsor, Representative Hashim, it was, you know, the penalty that was chosen in the bill is half of entering a house. So, you know, kind of like on the scale of the intrusion, or um, it seems to be in line with that. Um, and if you decrease the penalty even more, um, we really wouldn't have much of an issue with that. Um, would we, this actually might be a better question for Michelle, but would we need to make a provision in this to make it diversion presumptive so that the diversion statutes um, already say that any expungement eligible misdemeanor, there should be a presumption that the state's attorney will refer to diversion. Um, so you wouldn't need to change anything. This would fall into that category already. Thank you. Can you follow up from the sideline? Sure. Today you can. I mean, not you, but today. Yes. Nope, I know that's why I asked. Yeah, thank you. Today I'll go for the sidelines. Yes, thank you. So it would just be to say that um, we have case law in Vermont that says that the Supreme Court won't read in an intent element, a mens rea element, unless there's two things. One is that it's a serious offense, or two is that there's some indication that it was intended to be there but was left out. And the cases where they've specifically not done it are cases like this, where there are multiple uh, sections to an offense, and some have higher penalties and a mens rea, and the, other, and the next one has a lower penalty and no mens rea. Then they presume that it is intended to be a specific intent crime, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, strict liability offense, not an intent-based crime. So they wouldn't read an intent element into this. And um, there's no mistake of fact doctrine that would apply because the, in Vermont, there, there are mistake of fact doctrines in other states that work differently, but in Vermont, mistake of fact only applies when it negates a intent element, which if there is none, then there is no such thing as mistake of fact. But nine, no, if we so, if we put nine there, right? We don't have any objection to adding knowingly, So quick thoughts for another draft? Well, I, mean, I just, I just <laughs> like, yeah. kind of amazing because, I mean, originally I just look at it, read it, and yeah, good idea. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> there, there can be so much more to something that appears so simple. So. Yeah. <laughs> it right. ceases I'm, to amaze me. I'm, I'm totally fine with um, getting rid of the incarceration part of it. I mean, I. I don't think somebody should go to jail for this. My main focus is getting people, you know, there, there's two focuses. One is getting people <coughs> to restorative justice or diversion, and the other is the fact that many people in the public are really outraged at the fact that their vehicles are considered public space if they forget to lock it or leave it unlocked. Um, and I'm happy to work to make language that would protect the person who's having an airhead moment and tries getting in somebody else's car. I mean, I've done that, and apparently lots of other people have done that as well. And so, I mean, that, that's not who this bill is trying to go after, so to speak. Um, yeah, those, those are my thoughts. Okay. 
No, no, no. Sorry, I'm just. Or do you have? I mean, I have mixed feelings. I have. Uh, I think some of the um, amendments we talked about would be helpful for sure. I have uh, pretty mixed feelings about making. Just have mixed feelings at best about making a new crime. So I think I have to ponder that. And maybe have some more conversations with the sponsor and try to remain open to it, but uh, for yeah, I, I was, yeah, I mean, I was sort of curious, like, are we an outlier? And it seems like there were a few states that have this weird loophole. But I'm wondering, back to, um, again, if, if it's better to be a um, civil penalty rather than a misdemeanor, and if it's like, I can't remember which bill we did, where they need to make a referral to um, diversion unless there's a reason not to. Right, we have it as a default on. That's the presumptive diversion. Right, right? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. in the diversion statutes. So but, all, yeah. But diversion's more, access to diversion is actually more limited and civil. Right. Right. So that's the challenge, I think. I mean, is there but some? But that's our making. Is it okay if I ask? Yeah. That? Is there? There's some precedence for diversion and civil penalties. I probably want to direct that to David Chair. Uh, his okay. office runs the diversion programs. I mean, there's underage drinking, mm -hmm. right? but it's <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Underage tobacco, marijuana. Is, you know, write it in the bill. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it right. applies to non-youth. Mm -hmm. I think to make it a felony, so right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. Or a misdemeanor, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Exactly. Because well, that's, that's where it started originally, was with adolescents, you know? Yeah. That, that yeah. whole presumptive piece. Because you know, we were doing that back in the late 90s. Do you want to maybe check in with David, have some more conversations? Okay. With David. Sure. David Chair, you know, the, it, like, you know, kind of diversion access could we do without, I mean, I don't know if that's, if you're, if you're interested in, okay, if we uh, made it a civil penalty, not a criminal penalty, and, but look for a diversion pathway. And then the question of whether or not diversion, yeah, in many cases, this might right. result in, could diversion handle it? Um, but it seems like there's enough interest to have another draft of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, I can task subcommittee or, or just to you know to keep and then come back to it next week, even where we are in October and all that. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So, all right. Thanks. So we will move on to the budget. Hi. Thank you so much for the invitation to come testify. I am Jessica Barquist with the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And I'm going to talk to you about our appropriations request for this year. So as you, your committee well knows, the Vermont Network serves um, every town in Vermont. We have 15 member organizations. Together, we serve every square inch of Vermont. And in 2019, member programs helped 8,760 individuals and reached 12,000 youth through prevention programming in schools and other settings throughout our state. This year, we're requesting a $500,000 increase in state funding, which would go to the Vermont Network and its 15 member programs, so 16 programs in total. We currently receive an allocation through the Center for Crime Victim Services, but this appropriation has not seen an increase since 2008. And as you know, because we talk about it a lot in this committee, over those past 12 years, the landscape of our work has really changed dramatically. 
um, the opioid crisis, the ongoing issues with affordable housing have just made it really increasingly difficult for survivors to find safety and stability. Emergency shelter stays for the past three years have increased from what used to be an average length of stay of a, a few weeks or a few days. Now the average length of stay is 52 days in our shelters. And as Vermont continues to innovate and invest in our criminal justice reform efforts, those efforts must also include investments in meeting the needs of our victims and survivors. Our programs are both resourceful and tenacious and have managed to maintain quality care for survivors in need across the state, but they are increasingly doing more with fewer resources. Many programs have cut staff and are relying more and more on volunteers to provide critical services, such as our 24-hour hotlines. When asked about the, the landscape, the current landscape, one of our executive directors said, you know, I know that I should be doing outreach in my community, but I can't keep up with the people who find out about us and walk through our door. So there's no way for me to do more outreach into the community. Um, and we know that advocacy services work. Survivors who work with advocates have lower risks of re-abuse and are more connected to community supports. In 2019, 98% of the survivors served by our member organizations reported that as a result of the advocacy they received, they knew more about their rights and options. Studies indicate that when advocates are present in the legal and medical proceedings following assault, Victims fare better in both the short and long term, experience less psychological distress, physical health struggles, sexual risk-taking behaviors, self-blame, guilt, and depression. Um, and I actually have a little handout for you guys that includes all of these all stats. Of that data. Yeah, and it has the sources on it. Yeah. I I don't know that I sent that. My po my testimony was posted for yesterday, oh, okay. I think. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, so, although the needs of our programs are ongoing, um, we had heard that there might be some one-time funding available this year, and we would very much greatly benefit from an infusion of one-time funding. And I, I put out a call to our member organizations, like, if it was one-time funding, how would the, the programs use that? And I want to give you um, a sense of some of their ideas. So they said they would expand their emergency housing shelter, implement a countywide... Just thinking, you know, yeah. it'd be worth, uh, you know, checking, you know, if you don't, oh, maybe I'll just call Chris Winters, I'll find out. Out of my curiosity, there, I'm just going to find the answer. So, so, did it double for that one year, or come pretty close to doubling, and then? Okay. Um. So. Which one is it, Sarah? Sorry. Sorry. So this will be right here. So it was 2016. 2016. Okay. So we had an additional 186000 in 2016, and then that fund went back to being 38000 in the red in 2018 and 54000 in the red for 2019. What's that mean in the red? So that um, we get part of that, and then Crime Victim Services has other things that come out of that as well. So they overspent more than what came in that year. Hmm. So I'm still a little confused and wait, what so what so sixteen was the first year, so I'm assuming the money came in in seventeen, which which yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. But what what would have been your allocation each year? That is yeah, so that's um, that goes through a funding formula to our program, so that allocation is different for every program. Okay. Do you know the total number? Yeah, Sarah Robinson, Vermont at Work. Um, so the DVSV special fund funds our member organizations, actually only 14 of them. It does not include the Pride Center of Vermont. And it also funds a few other statewide projects, including 
um, the child advocacy centers, uh, some funds go to the special investigative units as well. Um, and so when there are years when uh, there are excess funds in that fund, they're kept in the fund, and then um, the following year, they're basically kept in the fund and rolled over into the following year. So that one year of increased revenue has been able to balance out for the last two years declining revenues and more expenses than revenues coming into the fund. But mm -hmm. I know that the Center for Crime Victim Services has, in testimony here and um, in the Senate, expressed um, concern about declining revenues in those special funds, mm -hmm. just broadly and generally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. So, so our deadline for our budget was today. So far. Oh, but Barbara is going to actually map before we left. Do I have the sentence in that was suggested? Do we have a Did you? Let me look. I mean, I sort of yeah. get it, refer to it, but let's see. We get it sent around. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so, um, so Barbara, I'm looking at um, the last one I sent you. Yeah. Pull it out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, can I send it to folks? That yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. fine. We, we, we were just going to edit real quick. I mean, and maybe we do it yeah, as a group, group because um, it, I know it refers to um, domestic, the network. Right. Yeah, it's a, where we're, I think, I don't know if you did too, but have, mm -hmm. have looked at yeah. this material yeah. down yeah. in the kit. Okay, I just emailed it. Great. Um, all of you, under the House Judiciary. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the, there's some, like the funky formatting maybe? Oh, there's totally. On the Judiciary request stuff, so I'm having a hard time oh, yeah. digesting the. Uh, it definitely is a little funky. Uh, um, yeah. And I'm not sure we need to even have that in here. Here's the list of judiciary. So oh, we're yeah. not weighing in on any mm -hmm. of their specific well, we, asks, or just sort of well, we other round things? sort of looked at those, in, mostly in terms of the security, I guess. Right. And Matt, so this is based on... And I could say Matt, Matt. Like, right, so we yeah. met with Matt, and Matt said, rather than us just go through request by request, mm -hmm. we should step back and look at what the objectives are for our committee. With which, with right, yeah. so not right, not the yeah. objective. So it was handy to have that up here. Mm -hmm. So we picked, and Matt's like, of course you can't have them all. So we picked um, three, and obviously geographic justice sort of fits in with fair and balanced justice yeah. system. And again, it seems like sometimes we're just not we, but the state. Like we make it up as we go along, rather than what works. Are mm -hmm. treatment courts working? Are reduced fines working? So really moving more to an evidence-based manner of operating. Um, Where did the, um, so the judges minimized judges needing to rotate through each other? Well, that, that came, you know, from some of the, you know, the, the testimony that we had had up to date. Not and this year so much, Matt, but. And then uh, Matt mentioned that maybe we needed to take uh, a little different approach to where is our our most spending in that branch. Um, and one of the, the biggest items are the judges themselves. And so if we're retraining the judges to do other courts, other districts, and moving them, it not only creates more of an expense for the whole system, but it also creates problems with some of the cases because it's possible for people to maybe have a different judge, you know, in certain things. But yeah, anyway, yeah, that I don't was know a, if I, I, it's sort of big. It's, yeah, it's a big. Yeah. No, it's it's a big I leap. <laughs> I don't feel like it goes in here. We can say this is a recommendation because right, right. it's the whole rotation. I mean, right. It's a, 
Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm I know. I was sort of worried disagree, about that. But I don't, I don't think it's a or maybe it's even we suggest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, suggest. I don't feel comfortable with that. Like mm -hmm. I have yeah. really mixed feelings about the yeah. rotation, and yeah. I think I see some real positives to it and some right. real negatives from mm -hmm. all the testimony I've heard today. And mm -hmm. I would just want us to have like yes. really yeah. serious discussion about that before, right. and right. probably more testimony before Absolutely. making a recommendation or even a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, so I would okay, so take that. Take it out, yeah. yeah. Which which actually is fine, and as you noticed, okay. the uh, uh, the energy that that stimulated. No, no, no. My point being, maybe that's what it needed to do here within the committee, because there's no problem with you know it's not like you know we're gonna take I, our toys and run away. Uh, right, right. But, but, and I, but I that think was a super heavy lift. I, it, and Matt, Matt even himself said, you know, before, you know, because that came up during our discussion, sometimes that's how you stimulate the move or even a discussion mm -hmm. within the specific area of jurisdiction, you know. <coughs> but I, um, but yeah. I just have, I have another suggestion or request, which mm -hmm. is I really appreciate the the. Um, first of the bolded lines saying we recommend increasing funds for the sort of outside legal resources is mm -hmm. how I, t I take that as sort of mm -hmm. reinforcing the ask from the Access to Justice mm -hmm. Coalition. Um, if I, w I would be happy if it read legal and immigration clinics. Okay. Just to, right. Because I feel well, yeah. like yeah. of all the things we heard about, it was that one was so compelling to mm. me because right. when people are not mm. good point. What about naming that like, like can we say like in the lines of the work or, or the sure. access to mm. whatever I'm just see, see that project the is. wordsmithing, you know, yeah. is is just that. Yeah. But what we referred back to and, and this, you know, is the core belief of the committee. And and that's where it resides. Because if you think about what Celine, Selena just said, you know, working towards creating a fair and, imbal and balanced justice system that works for everyone, you know, for a safer Vermont, you know, that's more inclusive, you know, taking that community, you know, that part of our community into effect as well, you know, and that, that was the intent, you know, so um, anytime that you can further, you know, or broaden that perspective, um. Yeah, so what about something like, um, versus then we, we recommend maybe appropriating and increasing because... I, okay, mm -hmm. let me just write, I don't have the right file open, so I'll just... Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put it in now, but let me try. So, um, so two things, one, should we name the, the, the access to justice, I forget what the it's the okay. access to justice coalition. Right, yeah. so... <laughs> right. So, so we reference, sort of, re you know, specifically reference them. Which, um, it, so it was the bar, it was the law right. line, and yeah. it was the way that came to us, right? And the immigration clinic. But it was all part of the right. 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 So I think right. if we maybe reference, okay, that, you know, that, it's an alliance. That that project, um, but by using the terms appropriating and funds, because they may, they may not, they may not get any funding already. Right. Mm. You know, right. Right. So. Yeah. so So we recommend funding for. So we recommend appropriating or increasing funds for programs included in the service on access to justice. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. Or the access to justice. Proposal and then access to Justice Coalition. Coalition. Yeah. Okay. But I would love it if we could specifically call out the immigration. I'm, to, I'm yeah. putting that in. Yeah. Well, that was in there. Access to justice. In there. It just said clinic. It, yeah. it yeah. is. I just reading this, I think you could. Yeah. I, I think it's encompassed in legal clinics, but I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would love us to just be a little more. Yeah. About that. like. Programs included in the Access to Justice Coalition that includes the 
resources. See, actually, their their sheet was more detailed than this statement. You know? For sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, yeah. so it's yeah. trying to capture, you know, that emphasis yeah. is the key. Yeah, I think I'm just requesting that somewhere the word yeah. immigration <laughs> would appear there yeah. too, yeah. so it's clear. Sure. Mm -hmm. Specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So included in the Access to Justice Coalition that includes legal resources, legal aid, law line, and immigration legal clinics. And, and, other, right. and other legal, right. and yeah. other and other legal, legal yes. supports. Okay, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just oh, this is really all of those rough. Proposals. I mean, it wasn't yeah, right. right. Mm -hmm. was, yeah. Um, all yeah. Of, all of those proposals that we heard were were all so valuable and meaningful. I know. And I think in the case of that one, it was like, and when people get deported and. Um, which is far more likely to happen when they don't have legal representation. Yeah, they exactly. die, you know? Like, right. So that's, there's yeah. just a, mm. a kind of urgency there. That that's I, one of our core principles. Exactly. Thank you. Safer Vermont. And then what if people think about, um, so it says here's a list of the requests. Do you think we can drop it? We can drop all that, because don't they, don't they have that? I mean, I don't think yeah. we need to say what, what part of it. I mean, unless there was some part of it we wanted to weigh in on, but it's something you talked about just starting to really early. I mean, we can structure any way we want. Mm -hmm. I just, we just followed maths. So he thinks it's important to have the list of the judiciary. Oh, no. Well, I don't know if he does. I no, put no, that no. in for. That, <laughs> right. that was just in for Coach to look at. Yeah. So, so, so that, that doesn't have to be there. It doesn't have to be there. No. Okay. Is there one? When you're ready, I want to jump back up to. Uh, oh, no, it's okay. No, it says in order to have more geographical justice, don't we want less geographical justice? Or more we, balance? We want more geographical justice and less disability. No, I understand. Yeah, so. It, to me, it was just a little confusing. That mm -hmm. Maybe to address in order to yeah. achieve geographic justice? Sure. Yeah. See, that, that's a clearer yeah, statement. To, yeah. to address yeah. it. Because yeah. the statement before that's have, on the board. We've already achieved geographical right. justice. You know, we're, <laughs> the, we're there. We live there already. Yeah. But, you know, I think when we made this statement last year, when we were putting, you know, our, our role together, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about working towards creating a fair and balanced right. system. Yeah. And this, this that, I understand right. what, it, what it's supposed to right. mean, and yeah. I, can, I can make it mean that in my, no, but, my own mind. I just thought it would be a little clearer. No, but Tom, Tom, your point about we understand it, but if we don't ask the question if somebody else understands it, we don't want to confuse somebody else. So, you know, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to take out the, all the judiciary staff from here is the list down. Yeah. And, and this, the, I'll send the I'll draft around as soon as we're done playing with the first. Yeah. And then the, um, in the top it says, we're reviewing the request from the judiciary in line with our committee's top priorities. Right. I lost part of the sentence there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's the, our committee. So it, you know what, it should be we... The top priorities mm -hmm. are those three things, so I need yeah. to make that clearer. And then I think in reviewing the request from judiciary, we make the following. Mm, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I uh, strongly support as a specific line item in the judiciary's request is the one-time funding for the Costello expansion around the. I can't remember what they're calling that project, but essentially yeah, to just yeah, right. create it's yeah. more accessible. Yeah. Right. I think that fits That's in under what we just were talking about. So I don't know if it's and the Costello. Well, or yeah. see, in one draft, we we did have when we were talking with right. that, we we specifically, you know, uh, targeted that program, and what we said was being able to replicate that as soon as possible. Because there's, it, you know, that's the key, it, because that really fits into what we're talking about as far as if you're going to get balance, it just can't be in one part of the state. Then we're just, you know, continuing the geographic 
And you know, did Matt think that somebody else had money for that? Well, that's the he, yeah. Right, <laughs> that okay. came up as well. Right. So. Well, I wonder if there's some way that we can still reference it as, yeah. as a pilot, yeah. and it does seem and, like it oh, fits under, as Barbara said, it kind of fits under that first bullet point in the second section. Yeah. Um, but maybe make it clear. And maybe somehow put it to the access to justice. Mm. Um, because that's yeah. you know that's what it what it details you know. Give me a few minutes. To yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, thank you. And other any other. Changes because I'll send this mm. draft around quick mm. so we can. Yeah. yeah. So while you're doing that, mm. um, DLS, I, I was in here that week. I think I remember it's sort of a whole. Why? Because I know that the. Which DLS thing? Um, so the 578, I think, with the D, DLS bill, we um, had the, right, the, the suspension. SR whatever, uh, right. 22 and other things. Mm. Um, Did we actually take that up? Yeah, we have testimony on most of the Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that the Senate yeah. is also very interested in it, so it's mm -hmm. a matter of, um, right. So, I know. So, mm. and my, I don't want to bother Martin while he's trapping, but I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Uh, James Dole, I'm with Human Rights for Kids. Um, and here, I was here today to testify on a bill in Senator Sears' committee over on the Senate side. Uh, S217, uh, which I guess is a bill similarly to what you guys took up mm -hmm. yesterday uh, on the House floor, but we have a provision in that bill to protect uh, child sex trafficking victims who commit acts of violence against their traffickers or abusers, mm -hmm. um, wanting to protect um, girls in these situations. Folks might have heard of uh, mm -hmm. like Santoya Brown. Mm -hmm. um, so we had Sarah Cruzan testify today uh, via phone. Um, but there's these really horrible cases where mm -hmm. these girls have gotten very, very lengthy prison sentences for essentially killing the people who had been raping and abusing them for years on end. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of a loophole in the law because they're, they don't technically qualify for self-defense. And so uh, we're hoping to close that a little bit and give judges a little bit more discretion in those mm -hmm. sorts of cases. And then um, working with Representative Rachelson on a couple of bills as well. and. Uh, dealing on with the wall. <laughs> on, on the wall <laughs> uh, on criminal justice reform, all focused on kids. That's our big focus right mm -hmm. now. Is um, mm -hmm. trying to get uh, the country really to focus on how the criminal justice system is failing kids and looking at all of these different issues um, from right to counsel, uh, making sure that when kids come into contact with the system at the very beginning, that uh, their parents are notified before they can waive their constitutional rights, that they have an opportunity to talk with counsel, um, as well as making sure that the felony murder rule isn't applicable to children um, in the same way that it is to adults. So it's really sort of top to bottom, yeah, yeah. looking at the entire mm -hmm. justice system. So that's why I'm down. Cool. So, yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank thanks you. Thanks for your work. Absolutely. Exciting to be back. I haven't been here since, uh, I think, 2011 when uh, Chair Chairwoman Grad and I were working with uh, former Rep. Rahm and, and Senator Sears on anti-human trafficking legislation mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. in, was, I guess, nine years ago now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Right, and, it, and it, we were told it wasn't a problem and we were being preventative. And, and, yeah, and, uh, it has, it's incredible that you were here yesterday. I know. I was like, the timing is... <laughs> yeah, we're just... Human services? Yeah, we just... I know. I, I, I was trying to say that in my introduction, we, we but... We did something with trafficking. Oh, yeah. 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 Because I remember I was in denial. Mm. You and don't you, know, you don't know. Right. Yeah. 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 And you remember working with MPU, you think? That's what I've, I remember. It's, yeah, it's so hard. It's Everything like, kind of blends yeah. together. I'm so sure. Yeah. Especially yeah. since you traveled to so many states. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been... Yeah. Uh, it's been really hectic, but uh, you know, it's but been I do a remember long. working on something to do with trafficking. Yeah, that's so what, yeah. Probably yeah. 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 And um, remind us of where your base, where your organization is based. Uh, Washington D.C. Yeah. yeah. James is a one in Seattle for a year. person <laughs> wonder. Seattle, that's good memory. Yeah. <laughs> Seattle for a year. Grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, lived in California even briefly for a time. A couple of years in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Kind of been all over. So. 
James is a great resource um, related to juvenile justice um, and criminal justice. We were talking about the death penalty before um, topic. So you have in, you have facts, yeah, right? I do so, have facts. Yeah. I, can, <laughs> I don't really enjoy that was gonna... um, seeing and Barbara them. is on the board. I learned. Yep, she's got a picture in the brochure. Organization. It's <laughs> 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 on a really cool amicus brief. That's right. Yeah. So. I don't know if I have enough folders. And James and I worked together when he was at, at the campaign oh, on that Life Without Parole Bill, which I think you and Keisha were working on and you asked me to work on because yeah. we just become chair. And so James was my go-to person and testified in Senate Judiciary and it was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Well, Senator Sears certainly has done a lot in terms of Justice. Mm. Okay, so, and people just probably got the final, final draft of the budget memo. So, are you talking about um, Woodside? Are you intending any other Woodside discussions? Or do you want to discuss? That is. Agreement? You know, not as much. I mean, a big focus of ours is really trying to uh, draw attention to the interconnectedness between ACEs, uh, early childhood trauma, mm -hmm. and how kids mm -hmm. end up in the system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of our focus is trying to reframe the whole conversation around early childhood trauma yeah. to get people to understand that our failure to identify and mitigate trauma in the first place is actually human rights abuse because we know our failure to intervene in a child's life will eventually lead to poor health outcomes, incarceration, early death. Um, and so that's kind of a big part of our focus. And then on the justice front, um, this summer we're actually going to be releasing a national state ratings map, kind of similar to what um, I was doing at Polaris, um, if you remember, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Basically, we're going to be looking at how states are protecting the human rights of children in the justice system. Mm -hmm. the, um, the blueprint that you have before you kind of lays out, uh, based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. the human rights protections that are supposed to be in place to protect uh, children in the justice system from the point of entry, uh, due process protections to sentencing to collateral consequences. So we're really excited about that, and hopefully we're going to establish a new national floor by which children are treated in this country. So that's um, kind of what we're, what we're up to. Wow, thank you. That's amazing. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Good. Thank yeah, you. Well, yeah, that was great. Yeah. And so, yeah, we should make sure you get to meet the folks you haven't met yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think I've introduced you. Thank you. So See, back, back when you were here in judiciary, I was in education. Oh, okay. You know, I spent six years on, on house ed, you know, and I've always been a children's advocate, you know, for you. Thank you for your service. Absolutely. No, thank you as well. Yours. I mean, that's, I mean, it was funny because I was talking today um, about how sort of this, you know, we have these different developmental paths mm -hmm. for kids, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school. And so a lot of what's reflected in the report, too, is trying to make sure that at those different stages we're treating kids the way that they should be treated. So, like, elementary school kids mm -hmm. shouldn't be in the juvenile justice system right. at all. Right. Yeah, and, you know, same mm -hmm. thing with, you know, middle schoolers, making sure that they're not in the adult system. Well, I think Vermont's taken some interesting approaches to dealing with some of that, especially with, you know, multi-tiered systems of support. And a lot of that is based on thesis research. And so around that same time that you were here before, that's when we were starting those discussions about MTSS. Uh, because what it does is it just looks at the whole picture, right? You know, and so how it's presented. I'm just you know, making some how we really present services. great. I'm catching Go like for some it. minor typos you know, and just grammatical That's great. Things. Thank you. I, I don't need to. Love to love editing. Editing. Yeah. I can clean yeah. it up yeah. really no, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Not better. change the substance, yeah. just like I love having someone help edit. Kids in the same places, you know, all of a sudden, like that. They get wrapped up. Yes. Okay. I'm happy to do that. 
yeah, complete wraparound services. So I wonder if you should yeah, send that version else, to my with the public defender's office. Yeah, I'm tracking changes. Um, well, Marshall was telling That's okay. me. That's okay. I mean, I. Uh, you guys also have a really great program where uh, we have it. Oh, yeah, like as well. Things. One child, one judge. See, I thought there you know, were. And right, for monitors and justice. Because that. that's what's You're happening, good. too, yeah, in so many places. Everything's become siloed. So. You know, the kids in the child welfare and system have a different judge, have a different attorney than when they're in the juvenile justice system. And, you know, they're the same kids, so the kids we're failing in our education, as you know, the kids we're failing in education are the same kids who are in our child welfare system, same kids who are in our juvenile justice system. And it's about breaking down those silos and really creating a paradigm of treatment and a trauma informed society. And that's what our vision really is, is the, you know, really. It's fascinating when you talk to Marshall. He serves on the Justice for Children's Task Force, and we have a data here in Vermont, and it was, it was started by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And so he's got this task force that meets quarterly, but it's got some serious like, marshals on it. Um, you know, the whole judiciary is represented, um, AG's office, Child and Family Services, but it's looking at the juvenile justice system and how all of those pieces intersect. There are no silos within that framework. It's pretty interesting. Yeah.